Throughout the many drafts of her proposal for a school for the arts, Margaret Armstrong always included one passage. It is not a budget entry or a curriculum note. It is a quote from the writer Catherine Ann Porter. The arts do live continuously, and they live literally by faith. Their names and their shapes and their uses and their basic meanings survive unchanged in all that matters through times of interruption, diminishment, neglect. They outlive governments and creeds and the societies, even the very civilization that produced them. They cannot be destroyed altogether because they represent the substance of faith and the only reality. They are what we find again when the ruins are cleared away. Since it first opened its doors in February of 1980, hundreds of actors, musicians, dancers, visual artists, theater designers, and technicians have graduated from the Baltimore School for the Arts. Some of the school's graduates have gone on to celebrated careers in the arts. Others have taken the lesson they learned as artists into other careers. Many of the students began their training at the school's TWIGS program, which serves more than 700 of Baltimore's elementary and middle school students. There is no academic requirement to enter BSA, yet the school consistently excels in most measures of academic performance. The students of BSA are chosen for one quality and one quality only, artistic potential. How this school came to be and the extraordinary people who contributed to its making is the subject of this story. BSA was built by many hands, but a special few of these founders were central to the school's development. They saw the school develop from its earliest stages and helped it to grow into something wonderful. And all of them were motivated by a singular vision to build a place for the young people of Baltimore to thrive. The struggle for civil rights and economic equality is the backstory of every American city. In Baltimore, this was most visible in its schools. In 1954, when Brown versus Board of Education came down, the school system moved immediately to integrate. But 10 years later, shifting demographics had erased virtually all progress made in desegregation. It wasn't very much that made you feel like it, it was going uh, to happen, that anything was going to happen for you. Children whose parents had money, they made a difference. but. The children that didn't have the money, they didn't make the difference because they couldn't. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson sought to address economic inequality in the nation. And this administration today 
here and now declares unconditional war on poverty in America. He passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was designed to close the gap between low-income and high-income districts. Title I was huge for the city. They got a lot of money in the in, in mid '60s after, after that act was passed. It inspired many to begin projects that addressed inequality, including one tenacious Baltimore City School music teacher. Margaret Armstrong is considered by many to be the mother of the Baltimore School for the Arts. She graduated from Coppin College. She worked her way up to become a citywide school administrator of the arts. Early in her career, Margaret made many efforts to bring the performing arts to Baltimore's schools. She was a credible, a very credible person in Baltimore City at that time. She was the head of the music uh, department in all of the schools. I met Margaret initially when she was on the board at Center Stage. She's the one that really always says, this is what we got to be doing. We got to be in the schools. We got to be educating young people. But it wasn't until she had Title I funding that she was able to create her cultural enrichment program. It was the first of its kind. On the surface, the program's mission was to expose city students to professional artistic performance. But Margaret's intention was more profound. By 1971, Margaret began to see the possibility of an even more ambitious project, a school devoted to the performing arts. I, I felt that something got me here. Just thinking about it, there were children that were ready to be different. And that's how we began to think about the school as a school in which we were going to have children thinking about what they were going to do and what they were going to be, what they were going to become. She petitioned the school superintendent, Roland Patterson. Patterson had been mandated to make changes in the system that specifically addressed poverty and inequality. In October 1972, he authorized Margaret to form a committee to study the feasibility of such a school. Committee members were drawn from diverse backgrounds and were a mixture of civic, business, and artistic leaders. The first meeting was held March 2, 1972. The minutes from that meeting suggest it was a whirlwind of ideas. Where should the school be? Who would attend? How would they choose the students? But in many ways, this was the worst time to start a school. The school board is badly misbehaving, and so many people were fired or moved to another job, sometimes with no explanation. With so many personnel changes, there was simply not enough stability in the system to start new projects. Suddenly, it seemed like there might not be a school for the arts after all.